You're listening to Nest Talk, the best and most elite Baltimore Ravens podcast on the internet. Now, here's your host, Christopher Linfont. Linfont bringing you another edition of the Nest Talk podcast, the best and most elite Baltimore Ravens podcast on the entire internet. And today we have a special guest here, friend of the show, Dominic Reddy Anderson. Hello, hello. And BaltimoreFeather.com contributor. Uh, Dominic, how are you doing today at the end of this pretty crazy week in the NFL? This has been a pretty crazy week, and I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing fine. And, of course, it's been a pretty crazy week for other reasons, too. I'm sure that all of our listeners and and you, of course, are dealing with the effects of the coronavirus outbreak. Last week, I touched on that a little bit, and my general thoughts Basically, at that point, I was thinking that they should hold off on postponing until it gets worse. Well, it's gotten a lot worse, it seems like. So, uh, lots of sports. I think this is the only time I saw Adam Schefter tweet since like 1889 or something like that, that no sports have been, like no professional sports at all going on. So, that's pretty crazy to think about. But, yeah, everything feels like it's shutting down, except the NFL is still chugging along in its off season here. So, that's the one bright spot we've got. Um, but before we head into the episode, I just want to let our viewers know what we're going to be talking about. Of course, it's mainly going to be free agency. We're first going to talk about some of the other teams, some of the big name signings. Then we're going to go strictly into the Ravens moves, losses from the Ravens and the quarterback carousel, and then talk about the best free agents available. Um, and make sure if you are listening to this podcast, make sure you rate us on iTunes. If you're on iTunes, subscribe to us on Spotify. If you're on Spotify, Wherever you're listening to, subscribe to us there. If you want to find us on Twitter, you can find us at Nest Talk or at Be More Feather for the Baltimore Feathers Twitter page. You can find us on Facebook as well. Just search us up there, Nest Talk or the Baltimore Feather. Um, go to BaltimoreFeather.com and sign up for the email news list so you get all the latest Ravens articles in your email inbox. This week would have been a huge week to have that, especially if you're trying to work from home and you don't want the constant Twitter uh, feed buzzing you all day long. But an email news list, of course, will help you out tremendously in your own leisure. You get to read that. Dominic, where can the people find you if they're looking to find you? They can find me on Twitter at Ravens Anatomy and uh, write a few articles for the Baltimore Feather as well, do a few graphics. So uh, anything on the Baltimore Fe- baltimorefeather.com and uh, at Ravens Anatomy on Twitter. Yep, and you can find me, as always, at Chris Linfon on Twitter. And, of course, I'm behind the at Be More Feather Twitter account as well, so those are technically my tweets too. Okay, so Dominic, the first, and this is just so the fans know here, this is very impromptu. I was writing the script tonight for this because I wanted to wait till Friday so we could make sure all of the Raven signings were done for the week at least because who knows what happens this weekend. But Mm -hmm. I was writing the script and I was like, wait a minute, I got to get Dominic on the show. So he was very (laughs) gracious to get on last second here with me. So Dominic really hasn't had that much time with the script. So a lot of these are going to be pretty impromptu thoughts here. But, Dominic, the biggest free agent signing of this entire offseason has to be Tom Brady to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. What are Most your general thoughts on um, that? I'm excited that he's out of the AFC. I'm excited whenever the Ravens play him that I have to play Tom Brady ever again, hopefully. So that's uh, one of the positives coming out of the uh, Tom Brady to Tampa Bay. Yeah, I, didn't, I never actually thought about that. Um, the significance, maybe not have to, having to play the Ravens ever again, but that's a very good point. At this point in his career, though, I'm not so sure how much he's going to help Tampa Bay. Mm. Now, I know New England last year, the question was whether they had the weapons to help Brady. Um, in my humble opinion, though, I, I feel like they had enough weapons. You know, Mohamed Sanu was a, it was a very good receiver before he got to New England. I have a hard time feeling, you know, believing he just fell off of a clip cliff the moment he walked into the Patriots locker room yeah. uh, a lot of the issues I think that people have blamed on the receivers in New England were really on Brady last year I think he struggled um, so it'll be interesting to see if he can bounce back in Tampa Bay or is this what is that a 56 million dollar contract along yes. those lines somewhere Six. and then 59 uh, with the incentives and whatnot okay believe. the interesting thing about this contract though aside from the huge price point for a 43 year old quarterback is that Tom Brady put in a no trade clause and he cannot be tagged, franchise tag, transition tag, whatever it would be in the future. He cannot be tagged. So 
I mean, I'm not sure if that means he, he wants to retire after two years, but it also leaves the door open for him to choose another contract to his liking in two years when he's 45. Right. Uh, so whether or not that happens, we don't know, but he's always talked about playing at 45, so that's very interesting. Um, but do you think it's a good move for Tampa Bay, though, to get Brady at this point? I think it is because um, because of the the previous uh, issues with Jameis Winston. I don't think you're going to get too many picks out of Brady, even though he is young. Um, I do see that. I do think he has a better supporting cast over at the Buccaneers with um, both the tight ends, Bray and Howard. You got Mike Evans, Chris Godwin. Although he can't stretch the field as well, he does have um, the running back uh, Ronald Jones out of USC. Um, kind of a speedier guy out the backfield. So I think he does have a good supporting cast along with the uh, O-line. But um, uh, to say, I, I couldn't predict. But uh, this is going to be fun to watch him um, battle against Drew Brees, even uh, Matt Ryan, because that, that division is really, like, always high scoring, always, like, fast-paced. Like, it's one of the more uh, fun-to-watch divisions in the league. So we'll see how uh, Brady uh, progresses throughout the uh, next season. Oh, yeah, I think the weapons there, I mean, it's a change of pace, definitely. Um, you know, no one's going to replace Edelman for him. That was his go-to guy in, in previous right, right. years. But I, I love Mike Evans. I was really high on Chris Godwin coming out of the draft. I think I was right about him. I like your point about Ronald Jones. I think that's probably the best running back he's had. I mean, maybe Sonny Michelle, you could say, is better. But in a long time, Brady hasn't really had a lot of running backs. I think Jones is pretty good down there, too. Right, right. Um, and the, the tight ends, you know, not Gronk level, but bringing back that, that you know, tight end connection that Brady's kind of missed over the past few seasons. It should be very interesting, to say the least. Exactly. And it is two tight ends now. So he has, you know, options he can choose. Oh, I like Brady more or I like Howard more instead of having no options over at New England. And that was one of his main targets was Rob Gronkowski. So we will see uh, how it pans out. Yeah, should be very interesting. Um, Now, sticking with that division, we're going to kind of go down this list here. There's some big movements happening in Carolina. Um, first of all, they supposedly were, al- quote unquote, allowing Cam Newton to seek a trade. But then Cam Newton s- came out and said, and I don't know if you saw the tweet, but he tweets in this yeah, really terrible that. font. Yeah, I don't yeah. understand why he does that, but he does it. I, so you can you can barely read it. But it basically says that he didn't actually ask for that to be allowed to seek a trade. The Panthers are just saying that's a safe face. Um, because they, they don't want to cut him. He's too valuable to be cut former MVP. Not that long ago. Right. People forget. That was only, what, four years ago now? Uh, yes. So, you know, this is still Cam Newton, but he is going to be traded or cut or something. He's not going to be in Carolina, that's for sure. That is true. And, and Carolina is moving on. And they've picked, I think, honestly, my favorite quarterback in this entire free agent class in Teddy Bridgewater. I think he's been underrated for years now. You know, I don't think the Minnesota Vikings handled the situation properly when he um, got hurt. That ACL tear, training for Sam Bradford, I think was a mistake. Letting him go and keeping and or signing Kirk Cousins, I should say, I think is also a mistake. They could have signed him for the cheap. Now he's getting a $63 million deal over three years in Carolina. What do you make of the whole quarterback situation there? I know it's just such a hot topic right now. Um, so the Teddy Bridgewater, I know you were high. You were uh, really excited. Um, he was getting a shot in Carolina for a pretty decent deal. Um, I wasn't like too, uh, like, like excited, but I mean, it was a good, it was a good take for uh, Carolina, but it was interesting to see that they got Teddy on this like long deal when they were supposedly going for Lawrence, um, Trevor Lawrence next year. So it was really, really interesting to see that, um, uh, the new coach and Joe Brady, uh, the offensive coordinator yeah. over at uh, Carolina to uh, grab Teddy Bridgewater, who said everybody was saying that he was really good fit in the uh, offense. But I do think that Teddy Bridgewater is going to take that ball and he's going to move it down the field. He's going to win games. He's going to be very uh, secure with the ball because that's what he did um, when Drew Brees went down this past year in New Orleans. So um, I think he's going to he's a good signing and he, he can he has a lot of room to progress because I do agree that the Vikings didn't did not handle the situation very well um, because he was a pretty he was a really good quarterback. And then when he got injured, you know, it all went downhill. We went to the Jets, I believe, or something like that, or he's rumored, I forget. And then he went to the uh, Saints and he had backed up Saints, yeah. Drew. So he, you know, learned a lot of things from Drew, I'm assuming. So 
for him to get his starting role finally. I'm I'm like happy for him as a person, you know, a uh, fellow Louisville quarterback, um, along with Lamar Jackson. I saw that tweet. So, yeah, I, now that you remind me of it, I'm pretty sure there were rumors about him going to the Jets. Although mm. I don't remember what happened and why that didn't happen, but, um, you know, I think. Of the free agent quarterbacks, though, I do think he was probably the best on the market. You know, Tom Brady is Tom Brady. You can't discount him. But his age, of course, the decline in production last year. Jameis Winston, we'll talk about him. Mm -hmm. um, Really not a great option for many people. Um, Now, I, I forgot to put this in the outline here, but I do have to mention it to you. What do you think about the Nick Foles trade? To the Chicago Bears. Um, I wonder how much of the salary the Bears are going to keep from the Nick Foles uh, deal, or if they um, like um, maneuvered it so they that the Jaguars had to take the the um, most of the cap or the salary, whatever, and they got you know Nick Foles as a player and took on less of the salary because that was a really interesting trade because a lot of people were saying Cam Newton, but then I saw later on that uh, Cam Newton had a lot of injury concerns that the Bears were supposedly um, not attracted to, so that kind of like, it was kind of a weird situation there, and then uh, Andy Dalton was someone that a lot of people mocked to uh, get traded to the uh, uh, Patriots, and then even the Bears as well, so it was kind of weird to see Nick Foles, I didn't see anything um, previous, but I think uh, he's a good backup. Um, I was listening to a different podcast, you know, that he can come come in for Trubisky and win some games if Trubis- Trubisky's having a little bit of trouble. But um, I think Trubisky's ultimate, ultimately going to win that role, and he's going to and uh, Foles is going to end up like um, the Josh McCown kind of like you know he's been everywhere. You know, he's a really good backup that can uh, come in and win you some game and win you a game pick up uh, the slack, you know, uh, a lot of veteran presence. He's played with a lot of players. So I think uh, he will be good in that aspect. So we'll have to see. Yeah, I have to agree with you. I think that Mitchell Trubisky is ultimately going to win that role. Um, you know, he, he's an interesting quarterback, Mitchell Trubisky, because he didn't look very good his rookie year. His second year, he looked like he improved a lot, and then he took a step back in his third year, a, a right. dramatic step back. Um, but I think the fire that's going to be behind him and Nick Foles has to motivate him at least somewhat because, you know, the bears will Matt Nagy will bench him. He has a right. valuable alternative in Nick Foles. Who's won a super bowl. Who's been in Philadelphia, done lots of things. I mean, Nick Foles won his last game in Chicago, the double doink game. We all remember that. Yep. Um, but I like your point about how the contract might be structured. I don't think anyone's reported on that, but yeah, I mean, no, Nick I Foles took anything. on a huge contract in um, Jacksonville. Jacksonville. I don't remember how much it was. I remember it being exactly. pretty big. Um, so, you know, we'll see how that works. Um, I, I don't know though, but we'll have to see what Schefter and Rappaport report over the few uh, next few weeks to find that. Four one out. years, eighty-eight million. That's what it was. Yeah. Jeez. I mean, I like Foles, but I don't know if I'd like him that much. <laughs> yeah, that's a little too much. Um. Here's another trade for you, though. I mean, I think everyone's pretty much in agreement God. that Bill O'Brien at this point, something must be wrong with him because he has no idea what he's doing. I mean, acquiring David Johnson is not the worst. I'd, I mean, I don't really like David Johnson as a player. I don't think he's healthy enough. He's not consistent enough, although he has a lot of upsides in him. But to trade DeAndre Hopkins for him, I think is a whole nother level of stupid. I've never seen know. a move this bad before. I mean, what are your general thoughts on that? Do you agree with me that this might be the worst move of the offseason, maybe of the past five off seasons? A hundred percent. It's going to be a historical trade. Like when you go back and you look at like, oh, like I wonder what trades, like like kind of like the situation for us Baltimore fans, how Elvis Dumerville got like mixed up in the fax papers. Like this is going to be like yeah. for the whole NFL or even – like for sure Cardinals fans and Texans fan uh, Texans fans that is gonna be like what the like DeAndre Hopkins like pr- arguably one of the top three best receivers in the league gets traded for a declining David John or supposedly declining David Johnson he's still very young and um but he just really had not the best past year and then a second round pick not even a first that's what a lot of yeah, people are saying like the the Davion Clowney wasn't for a first. DeAndre Hopkins wasn't for a first. So I think that's one of the two things like that are just like kind of mind boggling. And 
I don't know. It's DeAndre Hopkins. You know, like you're not going to find another receiver like him. Um, I mean, maybe in this draft class you will because this is a loaded draft class. But he was a one of a kind receiver. You know, a true number one uh, team guy. He's someone made a point. Um, someone like uh, uh, someone like a Odell Beckham, uh, Antonio Brown, kind of like the loud, like you know, diva queen uh, receivers. But DeAndre Hopkins was always to himself. Him, Larry Fitzgerald. So it's going to yeah. be like I think very humbling for Kyler Murray, and I think this offense is going to do a lot through the air, especially with uh, Cliff Kingbury over there in uh, Arizona. Yeah, it's going to be a very fun offense to watch. I mean, Kyler Murray had a pretty decent rookie campaign, all things considered. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think you're right that this is going to be a trade people look back to, and it's not like the the famed Herschel Walker trade where you know the Cowboys trade Herschel Walker and get the entire Vikings draft class. Like, right? It's not like you're getting a huge amount of compensation you're getting david johnson and a second round pick while the minnesota vikings trade and arguably i mean stefan diggs i think is a great receiver but i don't think he's the caliber that deandre hopkins is i think deandre hopkins has one step or one hop if you will above him um (laughs) but they got they got a first round pick and change for him in the trade to the bills so i mean it, it really gives you a lot to think about with Bill O'Brien, and you're right that he didn't get a first round pick for Jadavion Clowney last year either. So I don't know exactly what's going on in, in um, Houston. I just think you know this is really going to come back to bite him, and he's got to win and win now. Otherwise, he's probably going to end up losing his job over these moves. Like Chip Kelly, I mean, Chip Kelly was winning, given a little too much power, and completely blew up the team. This could be a similar scenario taking place in Houston. Yep, similar fate. I see that. Okay, so we're going to hit one more thing before we go into the Ravens here. Um, this literally just happened as I was writing the scripts before the episode, but Emmanuel Sanders is officially, according to reports, Josina Anderson of ESPN reporting, Emmanuel Sanders is heading to New Orleans. New Orleans is loading up for a potential Super Bowl run. Breeze only has, what, maybe one more year in him at this rate? Yeah, um, one or two. Max. So, you know, they've already got Michael Thomas there. Now they have the speedster Emmanuel Sanders who can do other things as well. I think Marshawn Lattimore is coming back. He was given the fifth year option and so was someone else. I forget who it was though. Maybe Ramchek, but I have to check. Yeah, that Ramchek. One. Ramchek. Okay. Do you think, I mean, obviously I think we're both in agreement. This is going to be a good move for New Orleans, but do you think this pushes them to be the NFC favorites at this point? Um, I could see that. Um, I, it's too early because, you know, all the mix-up. Uh, it's still the draft. We got the draft. So, I mean, maybe before free agency, I could see that. Um, I don't remember. I think they brought in, a, like, A.J. Klein. Uh, they return, uh, kept him, I believe. Um, so, I guess it just comes down to the defense. And uh, they still have Von Bell, but they brought in Malcolm Jenkins, who is a little bit older. So, it's kind of a weird uh, scenario there. Um, so, I'm, I couldn't like rule it out for sure um, necessarily, but uh, well, I guess we'll again have to see. Yeah, and you know, typically a 41 year old quarterback like Breeze would not be someone you'd want to have leading a Super Bowl charge. But he didn't show, aside from that injury, he showed no signs of regression last year. Looked as well as he always has. So um, I think with this new weapon, it, it should add to the offense. But I, you're right, it is too too early. We still have the draft to really name them as the NFC favorites at this point. Um, but now onto the Ravens, because everyone here is obviously here for the Ravens. That's the whole niche of the podcast. I think the biggest move, at least on the initial roster that we had going into free agency, has to be franchise tagging Judon. And a lot of people were saying, Judon's going to get tagged, and then we're going to trade him. But mm-hmm. we, we've been making trades since Sunday. It's now Friday. He's still on the roster. The Ravens have made cap space elsewhere. It, does it look like to you Judon's actually going to stay? I mean, the way the cap situation was working out, it looked like Judon had to go, but the Ravens have made some different maneuvers here, and they have enough. Yeah, so uh, earlier today I was looking, scrolling through Twitter, and uh, someone asked uh, Jeff Z- uh, Zrebic, I believe, um, how much space we had. And he said it's too early to tell because they still don't have the – Campbell trade. They don't. They still don't have the um, Brockers official numbers, I believe. So um, they they couldn't uh, gauge it. But he assumed, like he uh, he 
said, oh, I believe we have about around 10 to 12 million. So that's quite a really? bit of money um, so far, like even without the Judon, um, uh, without trading Judon and uh, even without the numbers. So it's enough to sign a draft class and maybe even a smaller uh, free agent. So we'll have to see there. But um, I think that if Judon stays, then once we get an edge, a second, like we need to re up on the second edge um, to kind of rotate with uh, Sack Daddy. Um, yeah. And then um, we'll be pretty set on our D line. But uh, if we do have to uh, trade Judon, it has to be something for a second. I think the biggest trade candidate right now would be the Seahawks. Uh, it looks to be that uh, they're the most interested. Um, and also the uh, Jaguars, but I don't see a second trade with the Jaguars for Yannick or a first round pick. That's absurd. Um, so I, I don't know. Like it's really a toss up. Um, but the Ravens have always historically been um, recognized for going a lot later in free agency. They did pick it up a little bit this year um, pre- uh, compared to prior years. But uh, I think. We'll see something uh, after the draft, maybe right before the draft. Um, we'll have to see, but it's it's a long uh, off season, uh, especially with the whole virus and stuff. So it's going to be a, a long wait, I, I think. Yeah, I, I I like your point about the Seahawks. I did hear reports that they were interested, but that was maybe a week ago at the at the latest. Um, mm-hmm. So whether talks continued, whether the Ravens basically hung up on them, I don't know yet. I've seen the number. It's interesting. Zebrick said around ten to twelve. I've seen the number as low as three to six. Mm. Um, but you're right. We it's going to be very difficult to tell until we actually know. But I we're going to talk about some other things like the Sam Cook extension, freeing up cap space that way as well. I I, th- I don't I think you're right. We're going to have to really wait until the draft to kind of know what the Ravens are going to do. Um, you know, they could just trade him right before the draft. But trading him to someone like Jacksonville, I think that you mentioned. You know, it is it is unreasonable to think that would happen because, you know, they franchise tagged Unique Nagakwe. It's about the same salary cap they'd have to take, so trading it wouldn't make a lot of sense. And there's been a lot of salary, I'm sorry, a lot of cap, not cap, a lot of franchise tag maneuvers around the league this year. So whether someone's going to want to get rid of their guy and need someone else's cap, we'll have to see. Um, I think it's... I. If I had to call it right now, though, like I'd say it's probably a 75% chance Judon stays at this point. I feel like, you know, the Ravens, if they were really like out to trade him immediately, they would have done so already, being how active they were. Um, But I think they're doing a wait and hold approach. And I think the ultimate goal, as Eric DeCasa said throughout this entire process, is bring Judon back. And whether that happens or not, probably will be contingent on you know, how close we get to the draft, what the outlook is with that, and how the Ravens feel about the salary cap once we get to that point. Um, quick little speaking, note. Yeah, go quick for it. Quick little note. Sorry about that. Um, some, uh, someone uh, tagged uh, Judon on a, on a tweet, and he was like, hey, uh, I hope to see you in a Ravens uniform next year. And Judon was like, yeah, you will. Um, next year, the year after that, the year after that, and, you know, one more year or something like that. It was like, Funny little response, but so maybe that's a little insight on um, how the the extension talks are going between Judon and the Ravens, or it's a little like you know, kind of a little. Uh, it's Judon being to... Judon, maybe. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, for those of our viewers that don't know, Judon's always on Twitter being very cryptic, but that's pretty straightforward. I know he. I I would imagine he wants to stay. Right, you always kind of want to stay for the team yeah. that drafted you, especially if you can make bank while doing it. Exactly. Um, so there's mutual agreement in that on both sides, just getting down to that number that would make Judon a very, very wealthy man by the end of this year. Um, but speaking of the Jaguars, though, the Calais Campbell trade really came out of nowhere, and that's fun because for some reason Eric DaCosta and these fifth round picks, man, I don't know what. Like what he puts in these fifth round picks, but people just want them like crazy. Now, originally this was supposed to be the pick the Ravens got for Kerry Vedvik, the kicker slash punter they traded to the Minnesota Vikings. I mean, that would have been amazing trading Kerry, turning Kerry Vedvik into Calais Campbell in about a year's time. You know, I don't know how many GMs could do anything like that. Um, 
but that's actually not what happened. We'll get into the Hayden Hurst trade in a minute here, but they ended up taking the fifth from the Hayden Hurst trade and giving it to the Jaguars instead. Not exactly sure why. Um, I don't know if that's a lower or higher pick. I think that the Falcons had a couple um, fifth round picks in there based on the compensatory formula. Um, but I, I overall like the Calais Campbell move here. I think, yeah. you know, he's a veteran leader that's been um, one of the NFL's faces. I mean, everyone pretty much knows who Calais Campbell is. He's got that voice everyone recognizes. Um, and he really hasn't too. digressed. What's that? The height, too. Yeah. Um, and he, you know, he he's hasn't digressed that much. I mean, the stats have gone down a little bit. I, I would really more point that towards the overall Jaguars defensive production, though. But I think in a Ravens system with Wink Martindale rebuffing this defensive line, it'd be very good. And I also think, you know, he's not just a regular defensive lineman. He's he's the kind of guy that can um, hit the edge and get the quarterback as well. He can go up the middle. Like, he's a very versatile uh, defensive lineman. So overall, I like the move. And for a fifth-round pick, I absolutely love it. What is your take overall on Calais Campbell? Absolute great fit. Absolute great trade. Um, Eric DaCosta at it again, just plucking he's just finessing teams out here out and just fifth round picks i don't know i'd love it great trade yeah i feel like eric DaCosta is starting to make us forget about ozzy newsom we can't forget about him either you know no. um the way this way this has been handled though not to digress too much but the way the ravens have handled the gm situation in transitioning from ozzy to eric was completely flawless uh and not i mean I don't know how many other NFL teams would even keep the previous GM on as, you know, like the go-to guy for the new GM to talk to. But the Ravens have such a good relationship all throughout the building with everybody in it that there's no power dynamics. It's just one person steps down, the other person takes over, and everyone's still on the same table. Um, but I, I got to love all these Eric DaCosta trades. I mean, he got uh, Marcus Peters, Juice Man, last year, which was really unbelievable. Of course, the Kerry Vedvik trade in there as well. Um, and you know, he's made a lot of different signings that are interesting too, and we'll get into those, but we got one more trade to talk about regarding Ravens player. And that's Hayden Hurst. Now, a few weeks ago, I wrote in an article and I don't know if I was on a podcast with you and maybe I was, but I was talking about Hayden Hurst and I said, we did, we did. I wanted a second round pick mm-hmm. and we got a second round pick. So I'm overall happy with this. Um, you know, just looking at his numbers, he wasn't the number one receiver. He wasn't the number one blocker. He was the kind of in between guy. Getting older, a former first-round pick, you want to get some sort of compensation very quickly for him if he doesn't pan out. And it wasn't that he wasn't panning out. He just didn't fit in on this depth chart because he got outplayed by two very, very good tight ends. What's your overall take on trading him to Atlanta? I absolutely love it. A lot of people were very um, sad. They didn't want to see Hayden Hurst go. You know, he's a first-round pick. Uh, He had a lot of uh, to do with the receiving on the tight end. Even if he wasn't the number one wide receiver, he was the trio and um, along with Nick Boyle and Mark Andrews. But um, honestly, I absolutely love the trade. Uh, It gives us a lot more room in the second uh, round and even in the fifth round. Uh, Unfortunately, we did have to give up uh, Hayden Hurst and a fourth round pick. But um, that second round, I think, is going to do a lot for the um, the amount of or not the amount, but the uh, overall aspect of who we want to bring in and who we can get later that can fill uh, Hayden Hurst's spot. So I think that's absolutely great trade. Um, someone maybe to look out for is uh, tight end from, uh, Sullivan from LSU. Just throwing that out there. Yeah, I, I like your point about you know giving up the fourth round isn't ideal in the situation, but you do get the second out of it. Here's an interesting thing to think about, though. The Ravens now have two second-round picks, their own and the Falcons pick. If they wanted to trade up in the first round from, I think they're picking a 28, if they yeah. wanted to trade up in the first round, they have the capital for it. They do. So, I mean, if they're eyeing somebody earlier, it's very possible they could even trade down a few picks. I mean, you never really want to leave the first round because, you know, the fifth-year option is so crucial in contracts. It's not ideal to leave the first round, but they could trade down a few spots if they want to get even more draft capital. So it just opens up opportunities in the draft. Um, but yeah, I did I did notice a lot of people were sad to see Hayden go. And look, Hayden, I think, was a great person. Um, well, still is a great person. And, you know, he really had a lot of chemistry in that tight ends group, in that offense, and the whole team, really. 
Um, everyone seemed to love Hayden Hurst, but I think it's a better opportunity for him in all honesty because he just wasn't getting the reps that a, a first round pick really should in this offense. Sure. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Then came the Michael Brockers signing. I think that was the first free agent signing we made. Um, yeah. Now, Michael Brockers isn't really a household name, but for those who pay close attention to the NFL, everyone really knows him. One of the, I think, I think at least one of the premier defensive linemen in the league. What is your overall take on Michael Brockers? Um, I watch, or I listen to uh, uh, Film Study Ravens, um, Ken McCusick over there. Oh, he's, uh, he's great. Yeah, great, great Big podcast. If you guys, Ken. yeah, if you guys are in the Ravens uh, network, make sure to check him out. Even if you're not, like he does great uh, film review through your ears, which is insane. But um, he was talking about how Michael Brockers is as a run stopper and how he can occasionally switch on to the uh, the pass pass rush. But um, that is something t- someone brought up was we brought in Calais Campbell, we have Brandon Williams, now we have Michael Brockers. So I think. Those three alone are going to be a brick wall um, on that defensive line for the run uh, against, you know, Derek Henry if we have to play him again. But uh, it it was a great point, and uh, I think he just really adds to this defensive line that was kind of like switching out a lot of players, um, had to kind of scramble, um, which did did do a good job, but, you know, they had to scramble late in the year. But, um I do like the signing a lot, and uh, it's going to add a lot of versatility. He did back in the um, the deal, so it's $5 million this year, 12.5 the next, and 12.5 after that. Um, so it's going to be an interesting um, signing if he does good. And he is a little bit older, too, as well. So uh, we'll have to see um, how he contributes, how long he can contribute. But I think it's overall a great signing. Yeah, I, I totally love the signing, too. Um... You know, I think Eric DaCosta saw the basic problem with the Ravens' defense last year. I mean, he was able to solve a lot of that in in season with Josh Bynes, with LJ Fort, and some of these other signings. But the defensive line, it, it got better, but it was never able to really shut down the run when it needed to. I mean, the first real symptom of that was Nick Chubb. It didn't go away, though, up until the last game with Derrick Henry. I mean, the Ravens can't let that happen again. Eric DaCosta knows that. If that's the thing that's between the Ravens and a Super Bowl run is just a defensive line, he's going to put a lot into that. Um, the age point, though, I didn't think about that till now, now that you've mentioned it. But Brandon Williams, I believe, is getting close to 30, if not 30. Clayus Campbell over 30. Michael Brockers over 30. The Ravens have a slight age problem that could be their Achilles heel on this defensive line. Of course, older players are more susceptible to injuries uh, and a decline in play. I mean, but these are all, I think, elite players right now. In the, some of them in their prime. Um, so overall, I think it'd be a, a good strategy, this whole um, defensive line realignment. Brandon Williams, 31. 31, okay. So yeah, he's on the uh, the wrong side of 30 there, but right. not too old. Um, but sticking with the defensive line, let's just skip down this outline here a little bit. Justin Ellis and Jihad Ward both re-signed. Ellis more of a outside edge rush defensive lineman. Whereas Jihad Ward is a tri- traditional nose tackle type guy, both contributors in the Ravens revival last year. Jihad Ward, I think, had more of an impact than Ellis, but I like Ellis as well as a depth guy. Just keeping with the theme here of the defensive line, Eric DaCosta basically shaped it up for this entire year. Um, do you like resigning both of these players, or which one do you think provides more value? Um, I I do like both of them. Uh, I think Ellis can be the immediate. Uh... Uh, replacement for Brandon Williams, even if it's not like skill wise, I think he just knows Mike like Pierce or or no, no 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 for Brandon Williams. So like once Brandon Williams, you know, uh, goes on to his next step, whether it's retirement, new team, whatever it may be, Ellis can step right in, and then the rookie behind him, uh, whenever it is, uh, can you know take Ellis's immediate spot. But so <clears throat> or yeah, I guess technically um, Michael Pierce's spot right now, but um. I think Justin Ellis is, is a good signing. Uh, he's also going to be one of those rotational players, but I think he has a lot to learn from Brandon Williams, um, being that Ellis is, uh, that's his you know main position. And then I think Jihad Ward is the most vers- uh, more versatile player where he did, he kind of reminisced uh, signs of Clayus Campbell where he would line up outside and then he'd switch on to nose tackle in certain packages. And 
uh, he'd go right back outside, and he, he was a big part in that uh, 49ers game where stopping the run. So I think yeah. both are great signings, and both are very young and cheap. So Yeah, I, I like both resignings. I was really pounding the table for Jihad Ward, and Ellis I like too. Um, I'm just glad they're both back. I think it's, it's, it's an overall good move here. And the Ravens, though, were not done with the defensive line we had. And it's a good thing we waited till today to record this podcast because we had one more trade. And this time, this is the first trade actually with the Pittsburgh Steelers since 1998. The mm. Pittsburgh Steelers traded for Chris Wormley. I believe we got a 2021 fifth round, fifth round pick, another fifth round pick, but we had to give up a seventh round pick as well. Um, you know, I think this move was conducted for, for two reasons. Number one, Adding two new defensive linemen, re-signing two new defensive linemen. Chris Wormley is obviously the odd guy out with Brandon Williams, with Clayus Campbell, with Michael Brockers all taking up the majority of snaps, and then he's got to sit behind Ellis and Ward. I mean, keeping him on the roster didn't make that much sense. Even for him, he needs to have his own shot somewhere else. Um, number two is a salary cap. Opens up some more salary cap. The Ravens were really clawing for air with that uh, for a little while there. But just does net the Ravens another fifth round pick, which everyone else seems to think is gold when they get it from the Ravens. But uh, that will be next year's fifth round pick, and that will probably be, be turned into I don't know DeAndre Hopkins or something like that probably. by that time, by the draft next year's draft. Um, what do you think about the Chris Wormley trade? Do you like that the Ravens move on from him, or um, I do because I saw you know again on Twitter uh, that Chris Wormley was going to be a, a free agent next year. And uh, it was kind of off and on to see if they would bring him back or not because both um, Brockers and Campbell will be on the roster. Uh, they, they don't have the the, the option um, to cut him, uh, I believe. So I think Chris Wormley trade uh, for fifth was was nice. Um, although we I think we did get Chris Wormley in the third. So it's kind of like, you know, dang, I wish we could have got something even more than Chris Wormley, but that is how it is. And I think that um, getting something from him uh and we do know and we're familiar with chris you know he went to michigan where um uh jim harbaugh, jim harbaugh coached yeah. yep and then uh he he actually referred him to uh john over at the ravens so i think where we kind of mapped out how chris formula plays unless he absolutely just jumps out the roof with uh cameron hayward over there in, in pittsburgh but um so I think it's it was a necessary trade, and it freed up about uh, 1.6 in cap after all, everything is done. So um, I, I I honestly like it. How do we feel about that 2017 draft class, though? That's the year he was drafted. Obviously, we got Marlon Humphrey out of it, but the Ravens' other picks in the second round, it was Tyus Bowser, who's still on the team. He improved a lot last year, but not living up to what we were hoping for. Chris Wormley in the th- third round, no longer on the team. Timmy Williams, also in the third round, no longer on the team. Nico Saragusa in the fourth round, no longer on the team. They traded away Jermaine Illuminor, a fifth-round pick last year. Um, not last year, fifth-round pick from 2017. Traded away last year. But in the sixth round, redeemed themselves with Chuck Clark. I mean, how do we feel about this draft class? So I, I feel like it's shaping out to be one of the more forgettable ones, aside from the highlights of Humphrey and, and, and Chuck Clark there. I yeah, I honestly couldn't. You, I, I forgot all about those guys. Um, once they moved on, uh, except for obviously Humphrey and Clark, um, Wormley was the last guy. So I don't know. It was a. Uh, it was uh, <laughs> lost for words. I couldn't. It's, it's tell forgettable you. in yeah. all honesty. But um, I, I think it's still worth it though, just for Marlon Humphrey alone. Uh. Any day of the week, we want Marlon Humphrey. Um, but moving on here now, let's talk about some of the l- lesser signings, uh, re-signings. They re-signed DeAnthony Thomas, a guy that did okay as a return man last year. Not great, just okay. Has a lot of speed, though. I think I was talking to you about this on a podcast previously, and I think you mentioned you wanted to see him expanded in a different role. Correct me if I'm wrong, wrong though. Uh, that is true. Expanded in the offense next year. Do you think that's going to happen, or I mean, is he even going to make the team this upcoming year? It's still all up in the air. It is, and um, I think that if he can excel to where uh, to where he can make a bigger um, more of a big impact in the return role, then he will get some burn in the offense. But if he can't do more than that, then we'll probably find someone in the draft that'll be able to return punts and. Or even Justice Hill, Marquise Brown. Um, we'll find someone that we can just clear his cap for. Um, 
but it's still up in the air. If it was, it's more of like a, all right, we're going to give you a second chance so you can really learn this offense, really learn this culture, really learn how to be a Raven, how to really return puns. So it's, again, you know, up in the air, as you said. You know, I really miss that magic Jacoby Jones used to bring, though. Uh, with the punt and kick returns, man. I, I've been looking for on eBay for one of his jerseys. I'm going to strike when, when a deal's good. But, you know, I mean, we were spoiled for quite a, a few years. Maybe it was only it was only three years, actually. But yeah. we were spoiled for that period of time with Jacoby Jones because every time he got the ball, he thought the back of the head, he's going to he's gonna knock this one out of the park. And he did it in so crucial situations. He damn near won us the Super Bowl. Um, like, I, listen, literally. there's a huge... You can argue that he should be the Super Bowl MVP over Flacco. I mean, it's oh, a big definitely. argument. I yeah, was rooting I mean, for it the whole time. Two touchdowns. I mean, I just remember people were saying, the commentators or whatever, you know, the 49ers have to get off to a good start in the second half to be able to come back in this game. To open a kickoff to Jacoby, 108-yard return. Just, oh, just and then the lights go out. Super Bowl but, yeah, he, he took the lights out with that one. But it was it was mm. crazy. Um but man, we, we got to find somebody like Jacoby again because I mean I I miss that so much. But um, going on with the resignings here, underrated resigning that not everyone's going to talk about because it was kind of obvious it was going to happen is Gus Edwards. They have to pay him just the league minimum. Um, I I forget who corrected me on this. It was either Ken McCusick from Film Study or Jeff Zrebic. I don't remember, but I said was asking somebody whether they could extend him to a longer term contract. They actually can't. Mm. until he's not an ERFA so they 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 physically can only pay him the league minimum which i think is about 760 770 um this year so i mean i i would imagine you're good with the Gus Edwards resigning oh yeah i obviously you know it's a great uh great back to have um him and uh Justice Hill uh oh, him so, yeah. you, I mean to back up Ingram uh so i think it's you know a uh, great signing, and unfortunately, I'm nervous that either he's going to get cut because we get another rookie running back. That's been a lot of people projecting that, or um, next year he you know moves on from the team, and either he becomes a big star or he just completely falls off. That's uh, sometimes what happens with a lot of these um, you know, backup running backs like Gus Edwards. So. I just hope he has a long-term career because um, he gave us a lot uh, to look forward to in his two years at, at Baltimore so far. You know, I, I don't understand the people saying we're going to take a running back. To be quite honest with you, yeah, I don't. That I, none of that information is coming from the team at all. But I mean, I see mock drafts and people are like, "The Ravens take a running back." Some people even saying we're going to take a first-round running back. I Somebody I Michelle? don't see oh, it. No, no, uh, DeAndre Swift. Like what? Yeah, I've seen that. Um, like. Yeah. I have no idea why would we we would do that. Look, Mark Ingram's not going to play forever. He's on a three-year deal. My basic hypothesis for the Ravens here is they're going to run out Mark Ingram as much as he can, and then once Mark Ingram retires after this contract, Gus Edwards will become the starter. That's my assumption. Mm-hmm. So, because uh, they're so similar players, and Edwards obviously much younger than Ingram at this point. Um, but I mean, in two years, it's really remarkable what he's done. Taking over midseason last year, I think he got either close or eclipsed 1,000 yards. I don't remember. And then this year, got 700 yards as the second-string running back in a run-heavy offense with a quarterback who got 1,000 yards and another running back who got 1,000 yards. So, I mean, to be able to get that accumulation is just really wild. Yeah, so last year he had 718, and this year he had 711, so... Both right, okay. really so, close. Yeah. And then again, he only got picked up as a start of mid mid season when Lamar took over. So that's again just pretty crazy. Right. Um, I think that's it on the re signings, the internal re signings. Other players they're looking to resign haven't done it yet. I've been hearing Josh Bynes. I've been hearing yeah. Anthony Levine, and then somebody yeah. else who I'm blanking on all of a sudden. Oof. Pernell McPhee. It was Pernell McPhee. Right. Right. Do you like the potential addition of all three of those back, or would you just want to move on from them at this point? Um, on, so Josh Bynes, let me start from him. Uh, at first, I really didn't think like, oh, like I like he was a like, great, you know, started this year, but I don't want him again. But I mean, uh, looking at all our other options, he's one of our better options uh, to resign him, or literally chase someone in the in the draft for a very high pick, um, and then. 
uh, Levine's just, you know, he's always been a Raven, so it's always nice to have him back. He's someone compared to him to, like, the Matthew Slater. I think it was the guys at Baltimore Beatdown Podcast. He was like, you know, yeah. he's the Matthew Slater of the Baltimore Ravens. So, and it's I can good truly see actually. that. Yeah, and then um, and then Pernell McPhee. Uh, if we can't find anyone like Clay Matthews, who's on the market now, uh, then I think bringing back Pernell McPhee would be um, a very viable option unless we can find you know, someone in the draft. So it's going to be very, you know, uh, if, like uh, dependent on some, like yeah. the draft, mostly the draft. Yeah. Fun fact about the three players we're just talking about now. All three of them won the Super Bowl with the Ravens in 2013. Wow. All three of them were on. Josh Bynes made the last tackle in that game, actually. Yeah, I remember that. Um, yeah, so... I, I like the idea of bringing Bynes back. I think he's he probably won't have a big as role as he did last year, but keep him, keeping him in the mix would be very good. I don't I do not expect us to bring back Patrick and Wasso. I feel like you know he had that opportunity this year to prove himself, and then he kind of took a step back and and was not able to take over in that role of C.J. Mosley, which of course a very big role, but a lot of us expected him to do that. So I think he'll get a different deal with somebody else, more willing to give him opportunities. Um, you know, it's my expectation that the Ravens will at least consider drafting an inside linebacker high in the draft. Um, and I think that'd be a good idea. And then have a rotational with Josh Bynes and LJ Fort in there with that guy, if that's what happens. Um, but if not, I think Bynes and Fort can still hold the fort down if, if, if you, if you will. Um, Anthony Levine, I love the Matthew Slater comparison. You know, he's a special teams guy, but he's also... He's also big in the secondary. He he fits in as a linebacker, safety hybrid. He's made plays before. Um, and then the other guy whose name I'm blanking on all of a sudden, Pernell McPhee. Pernell right? McPhee. Yep. Um, you know, he actually was producing pretty well for the Ravens before he got injured. It wasn't great production, but it was, you know, higher, way higher than most of us expected when he was um, signed last year. I don't remember how many sacks he got, but he was... Um, maybe either leading us in sacks before he got hurt. Yeah, he had three sacks before he got hurt. Only played in seven games, though. Um, did he come, Did he return this year after getting hurt, or was he only? He did not. He did not. Okay. Yeah, so he that was a Seahawks game, I believe. or um, I could be blanking on it, but it was sometime around then that he got hurt. That was um, but I, I think he... Back. Tony Jefferson, yeah. I'm all mixed up on all this. Yeah, um, but I, I like Purnell. I think... You know, as a veteran edge rusher, he'd be good. I don't think he'd take a huge contract. So, but we'd still need to address that position. Pernell McPhee, as a full time starter, probably won't work in in 2020. No. Uh, moving on now. We got those done. Now, um, one more retain retainment here. Sam Cook was extended, so he wasn't going into free agency this year. He would have been a free agent in 2021. But the Ravens decided, hey, why not keep one of the best punters in the National Football League on the roster for two extra years and push his cap hit back so we can make more now? Because the Ravens should have more cap space in the coming years, obviously moving on from some, some different players at that point. Um, but they re- reduce his cap hit by about $2.3 million, I think the number was, this year, and they pushed it back into 2022. Um I mean, Sam Cook is a pretty, you know, he's a player that's not going to get a lot of hype. He's a punter, but punters are people too. Um, so I think he's one of the best punters in the National Football League. Do you like the extension, or do you think the Ravens should really start to eye a potential replacement for the 37-year-old at this point? I mean, kickers and punters last forever, so let's just keep them on as long as we can, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Now, I don't know if you've seen this, but I think the NFL Network did like a mini documentary on Sam Cook. I forget exactly how he did it, but he was able to change the way um, punt returns were were set up because of the way he was able to kick it. It almost looked like he would kick one direction, but then the punt would go the opposite way. Mm-hmm. And he was doing that for a long time, and, and it's a feature on the Ravens special teams that nobody really seems to know about. Again, punters are people too. So, um, But shout out to Sam Cook. I mean, he's made a lot of money. I'm just looking at his career earnings here on Spot Track. He's made a lot of money with the Ravens, twenty nine million over Sheesh. fourteen seasons for a punter. That is a fat paycheck. Who did absolutely nothing last year, baby? 
Hey, listen, that's a good thing, though. <laughs> he just sat around and collected money last year because Lamar kept scoring. That was great. Um, now, people the Ravens are moving on from, we don't know if they're moving on from Matt Skura, but there's a low tender on Matt Skura the Ravens' place. So an RFA has to have a tender placed on them. The Ravens are not protecting him with a high pick value, no second-round pick, nothing like that. If he leaves the Ravens, they get nothing in compensation. They could, of course, match a contract that he would sign with another club. Now, it's been about five days. He's not signed with anybody yet. Do you expect him still um, to be a Raven in 2020, or do you think this is pretty much it for Matt Scarra? He'll find a new home. I really do hope uh, he stays a Raven in 2020 because he was such a good center. Um, He messed really well with Lamar, and they had a really good connection um, at the snap. So I I really hope he stays and I hope he rehabs well um, because he had an insane injury. He tore like three CLs, yeah, you know, it was so really bad. Yeah. So I, I really hope he, he, he rehabs well. He looks like he is. I'm following Twitter. Uh, he was on the bike a few days ago and then I believe Saw yesterday that, yeah. even he was uh, doing squats. So hopefully uh, he can recover well. No, uh, no, you know, uh, setbacks or nothing. So hopefully he comes back healthy and he stays a Raven. You know, he's a player that a lot of people were disappointed with in 2018. You know, he was okay at center. Uh, I believe he was playing center, not guard in 2018. It could be wrong though. Um, but he was okay, but he took a really big step in 2019 was actually leading the pro bowl vote for, for centers in the AFC conference before that fateful injury against the LA Rams. And that was a really fantastic game. But, once we got the news about the injury like situation, because they didn't really release how bad it was until after the fact, they kind of put a damper on the celebrations. But, um, you know, I, I like Skura, but the real question is, can he rehab from that injury? I, I would hate to see his NFL career cut short because of that. Right. Um, speaking of the offensive line, though, the Ravens cut James Hurst. This is a move I, I think that was pretty much um, going to happen regardless at this point. James Hurst, Signed an extension a couple of years ago with the Ravens, but since then has kind of... I mean, he was never really that great. He was more signed to be the guy that would plug and play in case of an injury or, or a substitution. Um, and he did that for a little bit, but he really... The the first big problem with James Hurst is that he could not win the left guard battle. I don't even think he was considered for left guard. And he'd played left guard before. Um, was not even considered, basically, for the starting position. At left guard, ultimately it was Bozeman. And then this offseason got suspended for four games, the first four games of the NFL season for performance-enhancing drug abuse, the NFL's policy on that. Um, the Ravens re-signed Andre Smith right before that was announced, so they probably knew about that in that signing. And it just felt like that he was going to go. Like, there was mm-hmm. no way the Ravens were going to keep this guy. Are, are you... Like, is there anything that you would have hoped differently would have happened with this? Do you would you have hoped that the Ravens would have kept him or? Um, honestly, like I can remember more uh, bad things with James Hurst than good things. So, uh, personally, I I'm excited that we get to move on with a uh, new player over at guard uh, or everywhere because James Hurst literally played tackle and guard on yeah. like both sides, I believe. Like he's been thrown in everywhere. So. Um, he did have a good stint. I forget which which position it was, but he did have a good stint, and I really wanted to keep him there. But the Ravens, you know, ultimately put him, re put him back at back up or wherever they needed needed him. But um, personally, I think to me, we had a lot more uh, bad times with James Hurst than good times. So I'm glad we get to move on and you know uh, see what our other options in the draft or even free agency um, at guard or uh backup um guard uh backup interior line uh and see where we go from there yeah you know, i think the thing james hurst will forever be remembered in baltimore for is he's the one that tore joe flacco's acl yeah. in 2015 i mean that he no matter what he did ultimately that was gonna be what he was remembered for and and i think i i always point that to that moment really kind of just pushing flacco to the sideline I think if he, he had stayed healthy, that, that he would have been a fine quarterback to keep for a very long time. But I think that moment in time, I mean, that was a, a huge problem. And, and Hurst, I mean, it was an accident. You know, the, his foot went right into his knee, but, mm-hmm. you know, he'll forever be tied with that. 
Uh, final Ravens move here. They declined Brandon Carr's option. Carr is a official free agent that saves six million dollars in cap space. But there are some rumors around that the Ravens could do a Ladarius Webb. So if you don't remember, Ladarius Webb, Ravens cornerback, one of the best Ravens cornerbacks in in franchise history. They ended up cutting him. Maybe it was 2007. I don't even remember what year it was. I think it was 2017. They brought him back a few weeks later on a lesser deal. Could that happen with Brandon Carr, and would you like that to happen, or should we just move on at this point? Um, personally, I think there's a lot of depth in the draft to, you know, pick up someone uh, other than Brandon Carr um, that can do quite a bit of, you know, covering and such. Like, say we get a, uh, um, we trade up for Isaiah Simmons, something insane. Uh, then I think we we can move on from Brandon Carr very comfortably. But he did adapt a lot of roles. He played nickel some. He played outside a lot, and he did play safety at the uh, end of his tenure with the Ravens. So I think it would be nice to bring him back, and we wouldn't have to look as uh, safety as a very, very high thing. Maybe we could look at it in as an undrafted free agent um, somewhere around there. But uh, I think if we did have to move on, it wouldn't be too hard to do. But... Um, it's always an option. If we can get him for very, very, very cheap, then I, I would like Brandon Carr back. Yeah, I, I'd like to see him come back if we can get him for $2 million a year or something like that. But, you know, he's probably going to get picked up by somebody to be a starter. He's never missed a game in his entire NFL career. And I don't think he's he wants in the league. He, I don't think he wants that to end either. So yeah, no. So he's been in the league for I, at least since like 08 or something like that. So 11 or whatever years it's been. I mean, it's it's been ridiculous. I mean, he the Ravens basically were making sure he kept that streak going, but he's been health. He's been a tank, healthy like crazy. Yeah. Um, someone who's not been very healthy though, the Ravens could bring back is Jimmy Smith. Um, yes. I I I don't know. I'm mixed about Jimmy. I like Jimmy when he's healthy, but I mean, it's just like a broken record every year. Something keeps Jimmy out for a, a, a period of time, and I don't know if we want to keep dealing with that. Uh, do you want Jimmy Smith back, or are you? You know, where do you stand on that? You there, Dominic? He's, he is. He's oh, played. I think well, we lost you for the first first half of that. Could you just repeat? Oh, uh, sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, so Brandon Carr always playing. Jimmy Smith never, uh, you know, always off. Um, but I think that Brandon Carr uh, is a better option just because he's played cornerback, safety. Um, very versatile on the back end. Um, I would prefer Brandon Carr. Jimmy Smith is a long time Raven. I couldn't see him in a different. I, I, I really couldn't see him in a different uniform, just because you know he's been here with the Ravens th- through thick and thin. So yeah, uh, I guess we'll just have to see. Um... It's gonna make for an interesting off season, though. I mean, there's a lot of different things the Ravens can do. Um, I did not write this on the. Uh, the the outline here, but let's just see if I can find it. The rest of the Ravens' free agent class. I mean, there's a few guys that we could still lose. Although, I mean, we talked about the other ones. Uh, I don't be it. Hold on, I can't believe I didn't put this on here. But real real quick, everybody, let me yeah, just go for touch it. on something. Uh, so we did clear up on uh, March 19th. Brian McFarland, Raven salary cap on Twitter. If you guys don't follow him, follow him. Uh, great He's guy. Great at the follow. Cap. Uh, so he did tweet out that Ricard's roster bonus has been converted into a signing bonus, and that um, it, and LJ Fort's 1.5 million roster bonus was indeed converted to a signing bonus as well. And I believe both free up about uh, like almost two million in cap or something, something along the lines of that. But um, uh, or 2.4 in cap space or something up. Uh, along the lines of that. So those are also two positive uh, things for the Ravens this offseason. Yeah, I'm glad you said that too. Uh, the Ravens getting really creative with the cap space. And again, that's a good sign for Judon though because if they're trying to clear cap space not by getting rid of him, I mean, there's only so much, you know, they, if they wanted to get rid of him, they would have done that by now. Um, now, I believe, according to Jeff Zerbeck, I could be, I'm pretty sure I'm right though, Brandon Kressler, Fish Smithson, Hieronymus Grassu, all off the Ravens. They declined to, to re-sign them. Or maybe it was Parker Enninger. I don't know. Um, Chris Moore is also a free agent. Honestly, though, I think I'm it's time to move on. Let's just yeah. Sh- 
it, it's it's been every it's for the past two three years I kept saying this is Chris Moore's year he has all the tools and then it just never happened I think we have to move on Brendan Trowick I think we'll move on from Trowick although I mean he's okay if we want to bring him back for special teams but we did bring back Jordan Richards to do that yep, that, yep. um Pecco I think is pretty much gone too you know 35 year old defensive tackle with the way we've been maneuvering the defensive line I just don't see him coming back he's not really needed at this point although he was a very good midseason pickup last he year. was he was okay so that's all the Ravens pickups and decisions now we have two losses I want to talk about let's first talk about Seth Roberts to the Panthers we'll save the big one for a second here but Seth Roberts came out on a one-year deal with Baltimore last year had some good moments, had some very bad moments, was a good blocker. Um, I think that's the best thing he provided to the offense was that downfield blocking. But he gets another shot in Carolina. Are you like where do you stand on Seth Roberts? Are you okay with the Ravens letting him go or Absolutely. Um it still stings that uh playoff loss. I'm not gonna hold it yeah. against him because he did do a lot for us in the regular season, but that playoff loss still, you know, stings uh, a little bit. Not too much to where it like when it was fresh, but um, I'm glad to see that he got a second opportunity. Um, it's going to be very interesting because I don't think the Ravens and the Panthers have any what similar uh, offenses, but maybe with Joe Brady and um, the new head coach, I forget his name is missing me now, Matt but um, Matt Rule, yes. So uh, Great with coach. Joe Brady, Matt Rule, um, uh, so maybe they'll cook something up with Roberts, um, you know, a veteran receiver that's played on two, now three teams. Um, good blocker. So we'll see what they have uh, scheme wise for Seth Roberts. Yeah, and just a side note on Matt Rule, I am absolutely in love with that move. I, I I've been following Matt Rule since he's was at Temple. Temple. Um, mm-hmm. because as a Rutgers football fan, we had just we were basically going through firing our head coach to the point where he was getting ready to leave Temple, and there were so many of us banging on the table for Matt Rule. Ended up making a different hire. Matt Rule went to Baylor, and it worked out very well for them. It did not work oh, out very well for us. So I, I do love Matt Rule, but I think he's a fantastic coach. Now, the second Ravens free agent loss, and it's actually kind of surprising they've only lost two free agents so far. Michael Pierce of the Vikings, I think we all knew it was coming. Uh, I There was no chatter that I heard about M- Michael Pierce signing a deal with the Ravens to stay. And then once the Calais Campbell trade hit, you knew he was out the door. Um, so I'm, what do you think about that? Cause I, I think there was just really no chance of an extension this year. I think it is better for both parties. Um, the Ravens get to bring in a new face in, uh, Michael Brockers. A lot of the fans, you know, uh, are hype about bringing new faces, especially in free agency, um, just fresh things. Um, but Michael Pierce was a great player. Now I think, Br- uh, Brandon Williams said something to the lines of like, uh, Michael had to play out of position uh, for both of us. Yeah, to I heard in the that. Field. So I think now that Michael Pierce gets to play his traditional Linval Joseph D tackle role, um, he's going to eat even more. Um, yeah, I was watching a little bit of stuff like him shifting uh, the guards in the center, you know, whenever he lines up at nose. And I think uh, in the defense with um, Leslie Frazier, I still believe, or is Leslie Fla- Frazier on the Vikings anymore? I forget. I believe, no, I, so I have to look that up. Yeah, I don't remember. But um, anyways, uh, with how good the defense for the Vikings has been the past previous, uh, you know, seasons, um, I think he's he'll, he'll fit right in. But sticking to that purple and gold, um, I couldn't see him in any other colors, you know. Yeah, I just looked it up. It says here on Wikipedia, George Edwards is the current. George no, Edwards. actually, no. Oh. Now since he's on, I clicked on it, now it says Cowboys. I have no idea who the, um, let's just check the Vikings.com. Let's just, this will yeah. tell us for sure. Defensive coordinator, Andre Patterson. Okay. Adam Zimmer is the co-defensive coordinator with him, though, and I, I'd i have to guess that that's Mike Zimmer's son. Um, of course, they have Gary Kubiak there as the offensive coordinator, which, I mean, all of us Ravens fans would would kill, but maybe not now because we have Greg Roman. Anymore, but would have killed, would have killed to have Greg, uh, Gary back a couple of years ago. Yeah. And speaking of that magical 2014 run, we're going to talk about the quarterback carousel. So we've already talked about Tom Brady heading to Tampa Bay with Cam Newton on a potential trade. We talked about Teddy Bridgewater, and then of course I think it's imp- and we talked about Nick Foles. 
important to note someone else who I literally just forgot as I was thinking of him. Uh, what was he? Oh, Philip Rivers to the Colts. Mm. But I want to get your opinion on the other quarterbacks available. And I said, speaking of the 2014 uh, magical run, I mean, that was a great year. Joe Flacco was released by Denver. I think it was a move that they had to make. They did it with a failed physical designation, though. I'm not sure exactly what happened there. Um, but I have a vision for Flacco, okay? And tell me if you think I'm crazy. Flacco, obviously, I mean, he hasn't been great over the past few years. There's no question. But I think he still provides that veteran presence and it would be a good, another good year as a bridge quarterback. There's a team in the league that right now needs to find their quarterback of the future to dominate and might need a bridge in between, and that's New England. And I really like the matchup for Flacco to England. Even if he doesn't start, I just feel like Bill Belichick would be the one to bite on Flacco. What do you think about that? I would love that. Just imagine Flacco in a Patriots uniform. That'd be intri- eh, very buy it. intriguing. Honestly, I, I, yeah. I probably shouldn't buy a Patriots uniform, but if, if it had Flacco on it, I'd buy it. That's that's true. I probably would too, just because it's the, the most. I don't know. It's you as something in a Ravens fan, or even you know, a gotta pay, do it. Gotta or it. even a New England fan. You know, it's something that's like what? Like sh- I might as well go buy this. Anyways, um, I think he he fits pretty decent in the, in the uh in the system. I think he would have a better arm like downfield uh, for Sanu and uh, the new. Uh, Nikhil Harry um, Dorsett if they bring him back um, so I think he, he could fit in the system very well as a starter or even a backup um, to whoever is the new quarterback over in New England but uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't hate it I honestly wouldn't hate it I, I, I would just honestly love to see it happen because of the way he tore them up a few times in those playoff games and even in some of the other games I mean everyone remembers that 2012 tor- when Tory Smith's brother passed away that game the day after whatever it was I mean he and Tory Smith tore that team up just has always had a phenomenal track record against them seeing him any I mean you never know maybe he wins a second ring with them but they don't have a lot of different choices here I mean the other two quarterbacks available you got Jameis Winston the 30 for 30 touchdown pick man himself and Cam Newton they're basically the best two free agents on the market of course they could somehow acquire Andy Dalton if the Bengals trade him, assuming they want to get Burrow. I mean, that's not official yet. Um, but what do you think about the other two? I have, I'm thinking, personally, that Cam Newton will be traded to the Chargers because they've already got Tyrod Taylor there, and I think it was you in one podcast mentioned that they may be kind of morph into a, a Raven-style offense with that, that going nice. on. I think that Cam Newton would make sense over there. I think Jameis Winston would make sense for the Bengals if they move on from Andy Dalton. Because, honestly, who else is going to sign this man? No one else really wants Jameis Winston. They could probably get him cheap as a good backup or a bridge quarterback if, if they really thought Joe Burrow wasn't ready or maybe he gets hurt or something. I do like both of your options for both of these quarterbacks. Personally, um, I think Jameis Winston would be decent on the Steelers. Uh, backing mm-hmm. up Ben Roethlisberger, um, something that – Ben, I don't think he has very many years uh, in the Steelers uniform. I think he is somewhere on the coaching staff that he would fit very well. But, excuse me, uh, personally, I don't think that uh, that I could see Jameis in the Bengals. Um, I I respect your, like, you know, uh, yeah. analysis. But I think he could be uh, fit very well in the, in the Steelers offense, um, learning from – Ben, and then eventually taking that starter role. And uh, maybe she's not the main part of that offense, but does quite a bit to win them some games and pick up the scene back in uh, in Pittsburgh. And then Cam Newton is just such a hard uh, like p- like player to put because there's teams that want him, and then there's teams that just completely shy away from him, but there's no teams that are like making a, gra- a very aggressive push. So him... I don't know. Like, I just don't know where he's going to find a trade candidate. And I, I read somewhere on Twitter, I don't know how credible the source is, but it said that Cam and his team is, is having a hard time uh, finding a candidate to trade with. So um, possibly look for Cam on the uh, getting cut within the um, coming of weeks. Uh, 
So, uh, again, that's another player we'll just have to see. Yeah, you know, regarding Cam Newton, I I haven't heard anything about anybody going after him, nothing concrete. I imagine they're having a hard time. The injuries alone are just going to scare people away. I mean, I know he was an MVP a few years ago, but those injuries are just brutal. Um, but I, I really like your point about uh, Pittsburgh. I was actually thinking about putting Pittsburgh down for Jameis Winston, but I was like, you know what? Let's spice it up a little bit. Let's say the Bengals. You know, being in quarantine now for X amount of days, I just start watching ESPN basically every day now. It's it was made either... our minds run and run and run all these yeah, possibilities. We get all these crazy possibilities. But somebody on ESPN was also saying, I don't remember if it was either Stephen A. Show I was watching a little bit this afternoon or it was NFL Live I watched a little bit this afternoon as well. It was someone on those two shows. I don't remember who it was. But basically was saying the same thing as you. Um, Jameis Winston's The Steelers would make a lot of sense. Back up Ben Roethlisberger. If they felt he would be a good option in the future, he could be either the bridge quarterback or maybe a full-time starter as well. But, you know, kind of the same player, the downfield arm kind of thing, although Jameis Winston really has to. I mean, he, he got eye surgery or something this past year. I mean, maybe yeah, he, he can actually see the, the correct colors of the uniforms now. I hope that so. might help. But, I mean, just needs to improve some way. Or, or, but I do like the option of Pittsburgh for him. Um, and maybe even for us, because we probably get a few picks out of that, too. Right. Um, now let's talk about some of the best free agents still available. Because, look, it's been five days. But, honestly, aside from the first day, this feels pretty slow, free agent-wise. Oh, like, yeah, must there have been. We had the first day, which is pretty crazy with some of the trades, DeAndre Hopkins, and then the Ravens getting Brockers and trading for Clay's Campbell the prior, prior day. Um, and I think that's when we learned Teddy Bridgewater was going to the Panthers, too. But it feels slow. I mean, Clowney is still on the board. Everson Griffin's still on the board. Robbie Anderson is on the board. He's a wide receiver the Ravens could try to pick up if no one else wants him. Even Devin Funchess, not the best player in the world. Um, was he injured last year? Because he didn't play a lot. He didn't. He but, did not. He was injured. Um, he did okay. not play last year. But you know, some maybe he could fit in on the Ravens some way. I mean, Jimmy Smith is still at large, and then former Patriots player Logan Ryan, also a cornerback, still at large. Are there any free agents you're eyeing here? Okay, so, <clears throat> um, so it wasn't really anyone that sparked my eye. Of course, like the big, a big free agents like Jadavion Clowney, Everson Griffins. Um, Xavier Rhodes could be decent yeah. if we brought him in for very, very cheap. Again, like something along, along the lines of a uh, Brandon Carr kind of deal. Um, Akeem Talib is still out there. Very, he's very old, you know, 34 years old. Um, Jimmy Smith. Um, <clears throat> but someone who really caught my eye was um, receiver from the um, Browns, who played on the Browns last year was uh, Richard Higgins. Um, someone told, like, put this out there. was like, hey, you know, uh, just imagine Richard Higgins. Like, uh, someone was like, oh, resign Richard Higgins. And it was a lot of Browns players. And that, thinking back on it, like, he was a very good receiver. Like, he always had decent games against the Ravens. And I think he was just a good receiver all around. Um, he's one of the very undersided guys, especially with uh, Odell and... Um, on the other side. Uh, oh, man. How can I forget? Jarvis, Jarvis Landry. Yeah, Jarvis Landry. Jarvis Landry. Uh, you know. Uh, Nothing but Jarvis... though. Do you remember, though, that the whole Ravens hype train for Jarvis yeah, Landry a couple years ago? He had and then a it... shirt. He was washing his car or something. <laughs> what was that? He was washing his car and he had a Ravens shirt or something. Like, there was a picture. Yeah, everyone was crazy. Yeah, we're, okay, we have to get like, it. We're, we're getting gonna get Jarvis Landry. It. We're going to win a Super Bowl. And then it, they went to the Browns. And we're like, yeah, was, okay, okay. That makes sense. Then. Anyways, but uh, back to Richard Higgins. Um, someone like Rashad Higgins that he's had decent games against the Ravens, which I think just just shoots his stock up because of how cheap he is. He's 25 years old, um, and he he does have a lot of developing to do. I'm assuming I haven't really watched too much on him, but uh, I think that's that's one of uh, the ways that the Ravens could go. If we're looking in the safety market, Von Bell may be another young person. Uh, Tajay Sharp and the receivers. No one really big. I don't think the Ravens are going to make a big splash because I think they do have a lot of capital in the in the draft. So I think they're going to focus a lot of their attention to there. Um, but if they do, personally, right now, I think Everson Griffin, if we get rid of um, 
uh, Matt Judon for a second round pick or whatever. I think he could do good um, opposite of Calais Campbell now. And then uh, bringing bring in like a speed rush on the other side. But uh, more realistically, if we do keep Judon, I think that Clay Matthews would be a good fit. Um, I don't think that there's any correlation now. Uh, there was some previous um, when he was signing originally to the Rams. He jokingly, uh, I saw reports that he jokingly was like, oh, I should have signed with the Ravens, you know. But um, mm. I think that Clay Matthews is the best option we have right at this moment. Um, if we do keep Judon, that is. Uh, so, again, that's m- more talk we'll have to see. We are in agreement, though, that Brashad Perryman is a bad idea, right? Oh, yeah, I don't know. I, I yeah. have too much uh, bad nostalgia bad with him, memories. so I, I think I think we got to just shy away from him. Every time I think Brashad Perryman, I think that one Titans game where Flacco just put it in his hands and he bo- bobbled it up and it went into the cornerback's hands behind him. I was like, like it was just so symptomatic of his entire experience in Baltimore. But, you know, it's it's so weird to see him. I mean, really, honestly, he balled out in Tampa Bay this year. He had a very good season. I think it was like 500 yards or something like that. For what he is, it's a very good year. I, I, I did see people talking about him to the Ravens again. I I just can't get behind it, though. There's just no, no way. Um, but, yeah, yeah back to Ever- like, Oh, go for Sorry. it. Uh, he did do that with a crowded receiver group over in Tampa Bay. So, yeah. you know, like, I really do hope he progresses. I wish he progressed a lot earlier, but, um, you know, I— Again, it's one of those players that it sucks that they had to go out with such a bad rep over here in Baltimore. Yeah, I'm happy for him. He's doing better. I'm really happy for him, honestly. He's playing well, but I just not a good idea to bring him back. No matter yeah. how good he gets, just don't do it. Him and Des Bryant, bad. Not Des Bryant. Antonio Brown, bad. Antonio idea. Brown. Yeah. That's it. What do you think happens to him? Uh, I don't know. I, I I don't want him to be reinstated at all, uh, just because he's put so much on the on the the nfl as a whole um i just don't want them to come back and everybody be like oh look at the nfl they reward players who blah 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 and did it uh and it's just like it's just a bad rep for the nfl as a whole so hopefully like i hope he finds a home in a different market uh other than the nfl um not to knock him or nothing because he does look like he's you know still fit still can run with the best still a good receiver probably but he's just done so much for like negative for the Steelers, negative even though I hate the Steelers, you know, like negative for the Steelers, negative for the Raiders. And then his time was cut short in in uh Foxborough and then he goes on down to Florida, starts causing all this commotion, bad allegations against him, then he does this couch thing and then he does this whole thing with the cops at his house. Like, I don't know. I just I just don't enjoy all the buzz the negative buzz around him, so Hopefully he finds a better market that he can sell himself at, and yeah, maybe that's the XFL. But right. you know, I I I just still cannot believe that this man Antonio Brown tried to fight Mike Mayock, Ugh. and that Vontez Perfect was the voice of reason in that scenario. Like it's just like if you told if you told me Mike Mayock was a, was going to be the GM of the Raiders and get almost get into a fight with AB and Vontez Perfect was going to hold them back two years ago, like I would have laughed in your face but i mean here we are it happened it's just the weirdest i just don't understand what why he makes these decisions but have yeah. you seen he's been hanging around hollywood recently i know they're cousins but he has honestly, he has i don't want hollywood getting too many ideas from ab i don't either i really hope it's strictly football talk strict like obviously it's cousin it's you know family and stuff but hopefully it's just uh, uh sticks to football and Hollywood stays most of his time on Twitch and we can just watch him over there uh, yeah. while this whole hiatus is, is about. You know, I, I feel like they're like two completely different people though. Oh yeah. Like Hollywood Brown is like so humble and like AB's over here like doing all these crazy things. It's just weird that they could be from the same family and still have a good reputation between the two of them. It's just, it's just so weird. Yeah, very odd. Um, Now I know you had some things you might want to talk about the draft. You want to say a few things on that? Yeah. Um, so I was thinking more of like, so you were talking about earlier how it was uh, just explaining on, oh, if the Ravens should move back, if the Ravens should um, move up in the draft. And that was, it's kind of conflicting. Like, I don't want them to move up and then not have enough capital and give up too much, but I don't want them to stay at 28 and 
not you know gain even more because uh i saw that someone had made like a little mock draft i know all every mock draft is completely you know garbage because none of it's most likely going to happen but um i saw someone do a mock draft <clears throat> and um they had this idea of moving back and it was like moving back then moving back into the first and then moving out or i don't know it was just really scrambled so I was looking for partners on who the Ravens could trade with to get somewhat of a valuable player. And I think that the best option is to move back uh, because really? if the Ravens could trade with someone who, like the Panthers who have a, let me find it real quick, who have a first, uh, second round 38 and a third round 69, both are very early um, in the in the second and third rounds. So if the Ravens could get back to that number 38 and pick up a Denzel Mims, who they could have picked up in the first, but it was kind of iffy. And then with the third round pick or one of their two second round or one of their would be three, if they did do this in, in the scenario, um, then it would be phenomenal if they could grab a Denzel Mims first, then a, a Kenneth Murray, if he's still on the board, or even a Malik Harrison. Malik Harrison is just the ideal middle linebacker that, we have kind of missed uh, throughout these years in Baltimore. So I don't know. I think really a really like significant or beneficial move for the Ravens could be to move back in the draft, get another second, uh, maybe another late second or a early third. I think that would be very beneficial and fill a lot of these immediate holes that the Ravens want to fill so they can win now because you did say something about, the Ravens wanting to stay in that first round and even move back yeah. into the first round for the fifth, uh, fifth year option. But with the Ravens and how big Lamar's contract it could possibly be. Cause I don't think that oh, the Ravens God. will ever move on from Lamar, but I think the Ravens are strictly in win now mode. And if they can get someone who just has that four year, you know, uh, four year rookie deal, then I think the Ravens are going to try and do that as best as possible and just get as many pieces as they can to win now. You know, I don't even want to think about how much money we're going to have to pay Lamar. Right. I mean, it's going to be record setting. I'm telling you, right, as long as he continues to play like this and doesn't get hurt. Um, but yeah, you know, I think it's an interesting idea, um, especially with the Panthers. Maybe we get Cam Newton as the backup out of that, but. Um, you know, a, a, a three second round pick scenario is very interesting, especially when you think about how deep this class is specifically in wide receivers. Like you can get what would normally be a first round receiver, maybe at the end of the second round, maybe at the, at the beginning of the third round this year to still pick in the second round with these receivers, I think is would be phenomenal. Um, I, I, I am worried about that fifth year option, though. I mean, the, the really nice thing about the fifth year option is it's usually not a lot of money. Although right. now with the new CBA, now that I think about it, it's performance based, I believe. Yeah. So it's not based on where you're picked. As long as you're picked in the first round, you can still get it, but it's performance based. So. So now how... think about think about the the Ronnie Stanleys. Think about the extensions mm -hmm. for the Ronnie Stanleys, the extensions for the Marlon Humphreys, two people who have literally at the top of their class and both the respective positions are now going to be, and even Lamar, are now going to be sucked up into that that CBA. So. That's why I think the moving back and getting as much draft capital early, as long as it's early, uh, as much draft capital um, in these next two rounds after the first is the best option. Yeah, I listen, that's actually, now that we're thinking about it here, I, I do like the idea. But, I mean, you're right. We're going to have to pay, and I, I want to pay Marlon Humphrey. I want to pay Ronnie Stanley, but these are going to be huge bills. We're going to have, we're probably going to have, once these extensions are made, once we have to start paying Lamar thirty million or whatever it is a year, a lot of turnover, and we might not need these fifth year options if we're turning over these guys on these cheap deals so much. So frequently, um, yeah. I mean, it it might be that we just let free agents walk at that point because if we're paying Lamar thirty a year, if we're paying Marlon like twenty a year, and, and Ronnie's gonna be like twenty a year as well, like that's that's what like seventy million dollars in cap space right there between three right. players. So, I mean, it, it'd be very interesting. Um, I do want to see how the NFL is going to structure its fifth-year option on performance, though. Um, you know, still valuable. But, you know, even if the Ravens temporarily traded down in the second round, they could still use capital to get back into the first round and pick 32 or whatever. Right, um, if there's someone the that they really, really want. Yeah, I mean, it's not 
that's what they did with Lamar. They traded – well, they didn't trade out of the first round. They, they picked Hurst after acquiring to draft capital, and then they used some of that capital to get back into the first round to get Lamar. The problem is they can't trade down from their typical 16 place that they, they were for a few years because they're a 28 now. Mm-hmm. So that – I, I always love trading down. I think the Ravens are really smart every time they do that. But trading down, there's not a lot of room to trade down this time. But no, not at all. I, I honestly wouldn't hate having three second round picks. No. Uh, no. Okay, well, that pretty much covers everything. And this has been a pretty extended episode of Nest Talk because there's so much free agency craziness going around. Do you have any last minute off the cuff predictions for the rest Ooh. of the free agency here? Off the cuff predictions. Um, the most, the most uh, likely, if it does happen, would be uh, the Ravens um, trade Matt Judon. Um, I don't know how close they are to getting a deal done. Someone said that they, one thing that they noticed from Eric DeCosta is he probably already has a deal done. He's just looking for the correct person to get cut so that they can bring in that person to fill the void of Judon and get that that capital up get that um the the salary up and uh get more cap room cap space um ah, but it, it it's up in the air so we'll just have to um see how everything pans out and um i think that's the biggest one i got i'm gonna go out on a limb here i'm gonna say the ravens acquire Tavon austin mm. small speedster wide receiver slot guy would be interesting in this offense uh, and then they'll probably go and draft a big boy X receiver um, to pair with Miles Boykin. But yeah, that's pretty much it for today's episode of Nest Talk. Dominic, thank you so much for coming on at such short notice. I'm very Just glad we had this conversation. Let the people know where they can find you again. So at Ravens Anatomy on Twitter. And then I write a few things for the uh, Baltimore Feather. Help out with the graphics. Help out on the YouTube channel. That's going to be coming soon. Um, also check out Top Trade Targets. For the Ravens, uh, front seven, wide receiver edition coming soon, um, or actually offense edition, offensive edition coming soon, and probably be on the Baltimore Feather uh, YouTube. So uh, hopefully we'll see how everything uh, yeah. couples out. So um, back to you, Chris. Yeah, so as usual, you can find me at Chris, Linf- at Chris Linfont personally on Twitter, uh, at Be More Feather for the Baltimore Feathers Twitter account, and at Nest Talk for the Nest, Talks, Nest Talk podcast Twitter account. Wherever you're listening to this episode, whether it be YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, your grandmother's garage, make sure you're subscribing to us, rating us wherever you can. Helps other people find the podcast. Let us know if you like it, too. I mean, ultimately, we're here to make you have an awesome Ravens experience, as we have it, too. Just want to talk some Ravens football with some fans. If you have any suggestions for the podcast, you know where to find me. Twitter, email us, info at BaltimoreFeather.com. Go to BaltimoreFeather.com as well. Sign up for the email news list, especially between now and free agency, because once something drops, I'll be scrambling to my laptop, especially being in quarantine, because now, I mean, I'm near the He's laptop all the now. time. He's right we, there. Yeah, He's I, mobile. We, we, we're ready. Like, we're ready to go. The minute they, they trade you on, if it happens, I'll have an article out within 20 minutes. So Easy. that way you don't have to keep track of Twitter when you're supposed to work. Because, you know, I'm supposed to be doing work, too. But we, we got bigger things to fish to fry. We got Ravens That's news true. to cover. Um, so, yeah, we'll see you again next week. Next talk, episode 70. Jeez, that's it's getting, like pretty up here and and hey, we're talk episodes yeah we're, we're aging pretty rapidly here uh but i'll see you again next week dominic will be back at some point i'm thinking about doing a draft episode with a couple other people we'll see if dominic can come on for that too um oh, yeah before the draft so uh but that's a few weeks away anyway so stay safe everybody wash your hands don't go outside if you don't have to make sure we kick this coronavirus thing in the butt and send it back to the threshold of history we'll never see it again so take care of yourself in this crazy time uh and of course we'll see you here at the nestle podcast next week see you later birdland sports for fans by fans find more great shows like this at birdlandsports.com